Lee. 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 What? There's a pandemic going on in the world, and we need you to make entertainment online now. Okay. Quickly. Let's do this. I'll be right back. Okay. I'm ready. to a new episode of Covidia Breakdown. I'm your host Lee Christian and this is Grace Williams. And we've got a huge show for you, stacked full of loads of stuff, lots of stuff that wasn't in the show last week. So look forward to that. What have we got, Grace? We have got Pat and Liv who are giving you a day in life of work on their farm in the Dordoin. We have got Dordoin, Dordoin. We have got legendary master extraordinaire Tim Turan this week actually being interviewed by Lee. Yeah, I picked someone who talked more than I do. Uh, we have got a vintage hair and makeup tutorial. And we're going to be taught some Japanese embroidery as well. Wow, that's incredible. Mm. Um, so first off, let's have our usual Corona update. It's week three of the UK lockdown and the wife of that Geordie guy from Big Brother is getting really annoyed. Day 22 in the Big Brother house and we've run out of toilet roll again. That was supposed to be a Geordie accent. And the second coming of Christ has been postponed yet again. Jesus, this guy's had more delays than new mutants. That curve's looking mighty fine, isn't it? Oh, we were supposed to be flattering the curve, weren't we? And we're just getting news that, yes, I can confirm that there's no more virus news whatsoever. So stay tuned for no updates at all. So next up, as usual, we have got Vincent Vegas scratching out what we've got this week. What do we want? Vincent Vega and so as you probably realize many people are doing stuff both on their own channels and uh, on other people's to get involved and entertain you and uh, spread the word and do things for charity and all sorts of stuff so we thought we'd uh, show you these guys uh, this is the band Freeman uh, you can find them at Freeman Rock and Roll I think and uh, they did a house of rock where they had plenty of people come along and play and uh, we thought we'd show you them playing out of their window. And after that, there will be a clip from... Armada of Secrets. Oh, 
Hi, this is Carl Dawkins from Armado Secrets. Uh, thank you so much for putting us on the show this week. Looking forward to coming back and seeing you guys more of what we've been doing. Here's uh, a little video of what we got up to literally just before we got locked down, and also a little something that Caroline and I did um, during isolation. Everybody, stay safe, wash your hands. I know it's a weird time, no one knows exactly what the right answer is, but at the moment, all we can do is try and support each other. Be safe. Thanks, our mother of secrets. That was great. What's up next, Grace? We have got Pat and Liv all the way from the door doing, and the door, they door, have, door. and they have got a farmhouse that they're renovating and some lovely little creatures to show you. So, so let's go down on the farm with Pat and Liv. Salut and welcome to Ferma B. We're currently in the middle of developing an agro-tourist project. So this place is currently a small holding and a building site and we're going to go and see what our day is like right now. So firstly, first thing every morning is dealing with the goats. So let's go and see Lev. Past the building materials, we've got some hempcrete here, as well as some lovely eco-friendly wood fibre insulation. And of course, don't forget the chickens. Let me give you guys some food. Just at the end of the kidding season, we have nine beautiful little baby goats in here. Oh, they're not going to start hustling me. For food because they haven't had their breath yet. Okay. And over here we have Liv milking the goats. 
So these three black goats here, they're a breed called Poitevin from Poitiers. Hence the And currently live. It's milking them so that we can have some milk for our breakfast and to make cheese. Now this is Snowy. Snowy's never seen a camera before and is a little nervous. Yeah. Well, it's this one that's hassling me. This is Goldie. We kind of want to be milked because they normally naturally want to have their little ones drinking their milk. It gets painful yeah. if there's too much milk in their other and no one's drinking it. So. Today we bring in our milk and then we filter it to get out any detritus that may have made it into the milk. And we pour it through what is essentially a coffee filter setup because the normal milk and filtering setups are very big and we do not need that much uh, currently. So I pour it through the coffee filter and then once a day I will either make cheese, like I said, example, beautiful style, or yogurt, or I'll just keep it in the fridge for our cereal and our tea. So we humans aren't the only ones to farm. Check out the ants farming the aphids. So as I said earlier, we're living on a building site at the moment. We've got a lot of work to do to this place before it really becomes a home and a chambre d'art, which is French for bed and breakfast. At the moment, I'm putting up a new ceiling in what will be the family bathroom. So this is gonna be a bathroom with sink, toilet, and a bath in it. And it needs a suspended ceiling so that we can put the spotlights in it and so that moisture doesn't get up in between those cracks in the floorboards to the insulation in the attic. So I've set up a laser level at the height that I want the ceiling. And I've started putting these battens across that are connected to the actual beam by a piece of wood. And then we'll screw this piece of wood across and that's what the actual plasterboard or firmus up is going to fit onto. So the next frame up here is ready and now I just need to screw on the piece of batten. So let's go. Through the wall, still a novelty. So I've pre-drilled this, I've marked it up and I've pre-drilled these holes. And now just need to screw it in. So we need to make sure that this is at the level that the laser line is just touching the bottom all the way along. And of course this batten has a tendency to bow a little bit, so we might have to wrench it slightly back into place. Okay, a couple of screws in. I'll secure these and then do the others afterwards. Let's go. <laughs> Like so. And that. Uh, oh, yep, that will take my weight. So it's late afternoon, and I've just about finished the batter. So I'm going to go and see where Liv's at. my sawing station where I cut the post down to size and I've just piled firewood for the future and then once they're cut I take them down to a, another point further down where I make the mistakes. This is 
chainsawing. This is my chainsawing station where they get cut down. Well, of firewood. So I hope you've enjoyed the tour. We'll be back in future weeks if Lee and Grace will have us, show you a bit more around here and talk about why it is that we're doing this. In the meantime, if you want to find out more, check out our blog at www.firmav.fr. Cheers. <laughs> Wowza, that seems like a lot of work. Yeah, a lot of work. Crikey. So thanks for sharing your farm life, Pat and Liv. Farm life! <laughs> I get up when the goats want me to. Very big house in the country. In the country. It's um, all been a blur these last few weeks. I wanted to cover something DC because I did uh, two Marvels in a row. So I decided to choose this comic, Deceased. I will give you the covers so that you can show them the covers. It's a pretty simple plot, really. It's only six issues, but I have uh, variant covers of them because they're so cool. These covers that she's holding up are the movie variants, which are all a spin on a very famous movie. That one obviously being Nightmare on Elm Street. So the idea with the deceased is that it's kind of like Marvel Zombies, really, if you're familiar with that. A uh, plague slash uh, virus type thing um, spreads through the DC universe, um, turning people into kind of uh, kind of zombie type people, really. And this is a really cool concept that takes loads of risks. That, um, there's a lot of shocking turnouts that I won't spoil for you. But um, just think about the uh, some of these heroes with the zombie virus, for example, the flashes. Um, you know how fast that could spread with one of them having that and yeah it plays out kind of like that there's great art throughout and there's great um, writing and it goes on for six issues and now there's a new deceased um, unkillable series which has just taken off so if you go back and read those you'll probably be um, up to date in time for the new one Yes, so next up I spoke to Tim Turan. There were a few, uh, few comments about how I dominated the last interview so I thought I'd pick someone who uh, could uh, not be out-talked by me no matter what I tried. Um, so here's mastering master and uh, genuinely entertaining knowledgeable soul Tim Turan. So, so obviously you are Tim Turan. Uh, oh, yeah. Legend of the Oxford music scene, and uh, to those in the know about mastering, uh, mm -hmm. a, a true expert at what you do. So maybe you'd be the best person to explain to everybody who wonders what on earth it is. What is mastering? Well, mastering is the first of all. It's the final process of the audio production chain. After me, it's the shrink wrap, <laughs> or what used to be the shrink wrap. You know, nowadays it's the, the Spotify or the Deezer yeah, yeah, or the indeed, SoundCloud yeah. or whatever. But after me, it's the shrink wrap. And once it's in the shrink wrap, you can't fix it in the mix. So apart from getting the optimum out of the sound from the files that people send me, you have to make sure there are no clicks, pops, glitches. You need it because you need to get the optimum out of what you've got, not just make it loud. Loud's easy. You just put it through a thing and make it loud. Uh, it doesn't mean it sounds good. It just means it's loud. Now, I've had a miserable time in mastering for the last kind of 15 years with this thing called the loudness, the loudness wars. War. Yeah. And a lot of mastering engineers kind of get the blame for it, but it's really client and especially label requests. I work for a lot of major labels, and they want their stuff to be bigger and fatter and louder than the other labels' stuff. Yes. They also want it sounding bigger, fatter, and louder coming off the radio, the radio. coming off the internet. Sure. Uh, it doesn't make for pleasant listening, Lee, I'll tell you. Are these but different you processes uh, for each, like you say, for the internet, for the mm -hmm. for CD, uh, for vinyl? I know that vinyl and um, CD are different. I do now. I have a very special but... process for vinyl. I cut a lot of vinyl, um, you know, for a lot of different bands and there's a special process that i've developed over about the last four or five years and also in consultation with a lot of uh, cutting engineers right. to deliver really brilliant sounding files that will cut beautifully to vinyl and it's quite a process i have another way of doing it for uh for streaming uh, download you can just use the cd quality files right. streaming is something different streaming is just what you want to hear on demand now, whereas download is you drop the file down into your 
hard drive, or whatever. Yeah. You know, so so I'm doing vinyl, CD, uh, download, uh, streaming. Yeah. Um, do you end up you know, doing so flat stuff and anything uh, like that? Do you end up doing, you know, like uh, when like high end audio files and things like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do right. high end audio, uh, flat stuff, thirty two bit floating point files. Right. Yeah. Uh, really high bit rates, but then people don't have the gear to play this crap back. Sorry, <laughs> crap aloud. I think crap's okay, isn't it? We'll, okay, we'll have yeah, to let crap go, is, yeah. can't we? I've got to learn to say poo and not <laughs> <laughs> the other word. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll find substitute words. For <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so you've so got to, yeah, you, you, there, there's high fidelity files. The, the real biggest problem, really, with the sound quality of audio is the uptake and the longevity of uh, MP3. Right. Now, MP3, originally developed by the Fraunhofer Institute in the early 90s, was a way of getting audio files, which are large things, mm-hmm. um, across Down the internet, small. which was really <laughs> slow. This yeah. is when we were using floppy disks. Of course. You know, and so, dial up and things like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, it was absolutely, you know, it, it would take, you know, three and a half months to upload your three minute single. Mm-hmm. And so the MP3 format allowed you to move files on the internet. Now, We've come a long way with internet speed yes, and yeah, file course, sizes, yeah. and we can we can do away with MP3 yeah. now, can't we? <laughs> if only. In essence, you know, you've got this beautiful. You know, you sit here in the studio listening to this beautiful high definition widescreen version of the sound. Yeah, and then what you send out to the public is a bloody thumbnail. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's right. the equivalent of a thumbnail. What you're saying is that obviously the file hasn't made the kind of evolution that, pe- that people no, should really. probably be yeah, using. Do you think yeah, that's you why see, people the... have taken to streaming so much? Yeah. Well, one of the things when CDs first came out is that everyone went running for the masters to transfer them to CDs so that you could have you know, the current catalogue of the day. Everyone wanted it on CD. Yeah. So you had to go and source the masters for these things, whether it was Dark Side of the Moon or whatever it was, you know. Sure. CDs kind of hit the shops in, kind of, I think it was February 1983. So we had to source all these masters. And very often they sourced, the only masters available were pre-EQ'd for vinyl cutting, which meant they had a little emphasis in the top end. Yes, sure. You know, Everything so to counteract is, the or, or work with vinyl and its qualities yeah. yeah yeah you lose you lose a bit with vinyl because it's an analog process and you will lose something at every duplication stage right so um that's what happened they kind of use these masters and of course cd um it gives you full bandwidth right down from the very lowest bass frequencies right up to the threshold right. of human hearing and beyond right um and so these masters sounded Bloody dreadful, really yeah. harsh, nasty. And so CD got a bad name. All CD was doing was faithfully replicating. Vinyl, but on, on a weird... Tapes. Yeah, yeah. Quite you strange. know, what was on those tapes? That's all right. it was doing. Oh, was it, was it what was for... So when... Uh, sorry, I don't really know this, but um, when... So did they use the same masters that they'd used for vinyl for tape, or was there a separate mastering process for each of those back in the day? They essentially made one master, and it just got copied, and they would make copies of the master. And every time you made a copy of the master, you would lose something, and so they'd make a copy of the master, and that would go off to the cassette duplicators. Yeah. And then the actual master, the one that came off the mixing desk on the big, fat, half-inch tape, that would go off to the cutting room to cut for vinyl. Right. Yeah. Now, a lot of times it was quarter inch tape. Uh, the transfers were made not using the right noise reduction because we had this whole right, noise sure. reduction issue. You used like yeah. Dolby A, Dolby B, Dolby SR. Hence why you used to have the little button on stereos for to yeah, actually exactly. do the noise reduction yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it was an encode decode system, and it's inherently lossy. You are going to get losses and faults, etc., right. on the encode. And then back on the decode. So uh, same with VHS um, video. For the for the person who's going, what's an encode and what's a decode? Um, well, it's um, you encode something on the way in to a mm-hmm. system, and 
you affect your process and then you decode it on the way out so that you can get the original signal back plus the whatever you what did to it, done which to in it. this right. case okay. so was noise reduction, removing hiss. Now right. we have bloody plugins on digital audio workstations to give you hiss and to give you vinyl Right, crackles. yeah, to give you the, all the old effects. Yeah, crazy, isn't it? Uh, it is get crazy, a warm really. vintage amp. Well, hmm. yeah, okay, I guess. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's in the box in the computer. That's where it is. Yeah. I thought it was digital in there. How can it yeah, be? Like if it? you want genuine, <laughs> if you want genuine analog saturation what you need is this kind of stuff here genuine big fat analog right, yeah. valve with, gear with knobs and faders with knobs and dials and, yeah, yeah. and valves and mm -hmm. you know yes that's right, what i yeah. used to work the magic in here plus extremely high resolution plugs none yes. of my stuff and your all anything. your leads all gold all gold leads and everything aren't well they? no no i i really? when i was teaching at university well i still do teach at university but i i was saying they were saying about do you use gold connectors and i said well everything's only as strong as its weakest link and right. the thing is you can have the gold connector but what about the wire in between that's in well, between that's, the gold connectors right yeah sure. well if that's made of like crap iron or something sure you need gold throughout the entire system in order to have a faultless chain. So right, gotcha. everything in here is hardwired, so it's not yes. plugs in sockets. It's it's soldered in, and right. it's all hardwired, so we don't right, get gotcha. any crackles. So you don't really need, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, I don't know how interesting it is to everybody else, but I found it interesting. Anyway. Well, you know, you can <laughs> I'll see if Grace seems it. If Grace found it interesting, it'll still be in. So you've been doing it how long now? This is. Okay, right. 1974. Was the first record you mastered? Um, it was the first time I bought a special device, which was a 12-band per channel graphic EQ with my paper round car washing and milk round money. Right. Uh, yeah. so that's what I used to do as a kid. I was very industrious. So I really would get up at bloody four in the morning and do a milk round and then finish that at six in the morning and do a paper round straight afterwards and then wash cars on the weekend. Yeah, sure. And earn money. And I go out and I went out and bought this 12 bands per channel graphic equalizer and all my mates came around and they said, you know, what the does that do? Is that, yeah. <laughs> and I said, it makes your records sound better. Yeah, and yeah. I've been doing it ever since. Wicked, awesome. Yeah, I charge people 50p to Amazing. copy yeah, I... their records onto a cassette through my graphic EQ with my settings um, because it was the only way you could hear music in the car other right. than the radio. Yeah, of course. Had a cassette yeah. player. Yeah, of there course, no that CDs. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 my Walkman was my best friend for years. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, and I, I, I bought, um, you know, I bought my four tr first four track and then went and recorded all the local bands and stuff as like, Excellent. that was my yeah. first, you know, experience. And then I kind of, you know, I remember when I came back to Oxford after studying at um, college, you know, doing music tech and everything. I bought my mm. little Roland and started recording bands. And soon after, I was at, at your place making them sound better, <laughs> making my recording sound better. There you go. Yeah, yeah. But then that's it. <laughs> that's the at least, yeah. <laughs> that's the process. You look at the film industry, you've got these fancy Panaflex and Panavision cameras. You've got fabulous set designers and everything, and you've got all that stuff in the film industry. And then it goes for post-production. Yes, sure. Where you color grade loaded, it. With the color grading, you can do so yeah, much, yeah. can't you? Yeah, so. Exactly, yeah, and that's what I do. I color grade it and get the best out of it and get the dynamic range right as well. Right. You know, that's, in that's a comparison that actually, strangely, I think people, uh, maybe who are watching this, I hope, uh, will actually get because like color grading in recent times has actually become like a more um, popular issue in film like the, oh look at this really grey movie compared yeah, to like Harry Potter like films or one, the yeah. Lord of the Ring films yeah. you know they've all got yeah. that look yeah know. so and people know a bit more what it what it is now I think than uh, yeah. and still mastering is a bit of a mystery I think to a lot of people like Howie Weinberg we all see his name on the back of a CD but I don't yeah. know if anybody knows they just know he's on the back of good CDs I don't think they yeah. necessarily know what he does so yeah 
So as you're um, like with, say, Harry Weinberg, he's uh, what, 70 something now. And yeah, so yeah. obviously his hearing might not be what it, I mean, it might be amazing, but like it might not be. Is there like, do you feel like there's a shelf life on mastering or do you, have you got like, there's a certain <coughs> amount that you do without even listening to it really in terms of knowing if you can where. hear, If you can hear the stuff. And my clients are still amazed at the stuff I pick out in their mixes. And these are mixes that mixes that they've been listening to for bloody ages. You know, they come out of the studio and you, we know, you know when you come out of the studio and you've got your mixes of your new track and you listen to it again and again and again and again and again and again. And then you come out here and we'll bang it on the mastering system. Mm-hmm. And on the first listen, I'll go, ooh, what's that? And they'll go, ooh, I never noticed that. Yeah, How did yeah. you hear that? And the other thing is, it's a kind of, um, um, it's funny, actually, Professor Martin Clunan from the University of Glasgow interviewed me, and we got into the subject of um, hearing as well. And I said to him that when I was eight years old uh, at school, we used to have this uh, medical, I don't know if they do it anymore. In fact, there are certain tests in that medical that you probably get arrested for if you did now. (laughs) There are. There was a thing called the cough and drop, where the, yes, the nice doctor that. would hold certain yes, parts. Yes, I remember that all cough. too well. Yeah, that's. I'm not. Yeah. Too, I'm not too young for the for that. Yeah. yeah. What, what were you <laughs> testing exactly? Is what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> How good is your coughing or something? Like <laughs> but anyway, they also look in your ear hole. So he yes. went to yank my ear, and he got his little torch thing, and he said, "Good lord, I can see your eardrum." You know, and I, I haven't right. got much of an S bend or a kink in right, my eardrum. Okay. Yeah. So I used so to be able to helps? hear. Well, Maybe yeah, because I used to further. sit and watch the TV. Yeah. Old TVs were cathode ray tubes, and they used to oscillate at fifteen thousand two hundred cycles a second, right. fifteen point two kilohertz, and it'd be this little, this little birdie right up the top that no one else right. seemed to hear yes. it so it sure. drive me mental yeah yeah so yeah it's all right but, you know i mean i get to work on a huge range of material whether i'm doing devotional choral music or uh, i had a number one urban hit a couple of years ago with a london artist called bibs right wicked yeah and uh i was gonna ask you could you give us a bit of a like a weird like whistle stop tour through like a load of records there that you're you're proud of that you've done. Bands yeah, and dancing records. with the Antichrist, Marilyn Manson. Right, that awesome. got me a name in the very early noughties. Wicked. I already had a name doing bands like uh, the Damned, the Ruts, the Buzzcocks, right. the Ramones. Awesome. Uh, I also remastered entire back catalogues for Thin yes. Lizzy, Status Quo, Motorhead, Susie Quattro, The Osmonds, Slade, Slade. Oh God, Slade! In fact, their box set is sat. Just there, Lee, there it is, look there, Slade. Yes, yeah. When Slade rocks the world, and I did every single album they ever did. Right, wicked. Mastered. I know it. I had Jimmy Lee sat here in the studio with me on those, sofa, on those sofas. Awesome, I sorry, Jimmy I, Lee. I just remembered that one, that that was one of the box sets that you'd done, so, but carry on, carry on. Yeah, but, you know, Jimmy Lee, was uh, he was uh, hilarious. He came in and he, he said to me, uh, I had a pawn shop. With John Bonham, because we were out selling Led Zeppelin at the time. <laughs> really? Wow. He said in 1972, Slade were out selling Led Zeppelin. Mate, that's... Jimmy Lee got into Did he say a... who won the fight? Well, he reckoned he did. And you know what? <laughs> they were a bunch of brummy partners. Yeah, brickies in makeup, yeah. yeah. And, and steel factory workers and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> yeah. You look at early photographs of Slade, they were a skinhead band, man. They were a bunch of tough right, yeah. nuts. <laughs> you know, so it's yeah. only, people only know Slade, you know, in, in their silly costumes. Sure, of course, and them. they have this one lasting memory of, it's Christmas! <laughs> there you go, yeah. But I mastered that single. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> with Jimmy Lee. <laughs> that must be cha-ching. <laughs> I wish I got the money, but, you I know, know. Yeah, but can you imagine? They, it needs. It, it must need a new well. master every year, right? Like, you should just say, guys, it's going to need a new master. I think yeah. you should send it in. <laughs> every it's there. Yeah, I did a good job on it. They loved but, it. Definitely. But, you know, my name's, you know, Susie Quattro was brilliant. I, I spent a lot of time on the phone with Susie Quattro. Yeah. 
and she she was one of these people who'd still be going, oh, Tim, sugar lamp, sunny bunch, you know. <laughs> I think you know, it's really quite true. <laughs> you just did the uh, the massive supergrass as well, the big orange. I did indeed. I did all the original thing. content. I worked the mammoth solidly for six weeks. Wow, um, the original content on that with Mickey Quinn. Mickey was here for most of it, about half of it. Record, awesome. Yeah, had a quick jet chat, chat with Gaz as well because he supplied a lot of the material too. Right, and of yeah, course, I've done Gaz's cool. first solo album, "Here Come the Bombs." Right, and cool, wicked. I, I did a lot of all the extra stuff for the uh, Aisha Coco twentieth anniversary reissue right, in about yeah. twenty fifteen. Awesome! That must have been yeah. fun going through all of that. That's like the that's like the heyday of Oxford. Like, just I was just yeah, listening yeah. to a few bits earlier, and it's uh, it just all comes flooding back. Really, the whole time when you listen to it, it's like a portal, time portal to to that exact kind of you know Oxford. Yeah, in yeah. It's, it really You've got the bubbling. original albums. You've got the original albums in the box. They they were already remastered anyway. Yes. Uh, back in, I think, 2015. But it yes, that's the, right, yeah. All the original content. So we've got Roots and Vines, which is uh, a lot of the really early demos, mini discs, cassettes, everything that Gaz and Mick have Wicked. pulled out of their basements. And a lot of rarities, B-sides, outtakes, monitor yeah, mixes, yeah. tracks that weren't didn't make it on the album. Yeah, yeah. But the gold, Amazing. the actual gold for me is the four CD set we did of live stuff glastonbury 97 uh reading tea in the yeah. park jules holland uh yeah Ratcliffe sessions yeah. uh ronnie scott's you know fantastic and mick gave me this cassette recording of it but the speed of it was slightly elevated because whatever machine it had been recorded on was a bit right. bollocks and yeah sure and so everyone's got sort of slightly higher pitched voices, and it it's sounds a, almost pinky and perky. It's a bit really the, uh, a bit like um, uh, we're not supposed to on the. Um, yeah. <laughs> people will be thinking that's their real voices. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so it's yeah. just it's just brilliant, brilliant thing to work on. But you know, it's the same thing with status quo. When I was mastering all their stuff, um, there's one of their albums, a really famous album of theirs called Pile Driver. Right. And uh, I was going through the masters for Pile Driver to remaster that album, and I found at the end of the master tape this dirty joke that wasn't on the original album. Ah, oh, wicked! And it's a, it was a about a girl and some coconuts on a desert island right, with yeah. someone. I can't quite remember the the, the content, the, <laughs> yeah, the, the order, context yeah. of the joke. But <laughs> I ended up having to talk. I spoke to Francis Rossi on the phone. I was going, Francis, there's this joke on the end and he's going oh what is it so i sent him a copy of it yeah and he's going i'd love to put it on but if we did the fans would go crazy because they just want the original record so it never made it on the record uh, it was okay. same with um in 2014 when i mastered ginger baker's oh, right. last record which was called why now i've got that somewhere but one secondly i'll see if i okay. this is a brilliant record mate Look at that photo. Oh, wow. Awesome. <laughs> He's such a cheery guy. How was he to work with? Did you have much, like, chat with him on it? He was supposed to come up to the studio, and he's, I spoke to him on the phone, and he said, um, no one will give me a lift, Tim, and I can't drive in the dark. And this was, like, sort of early March in 2014, so it would go like it would be dark by yeah, the time. yeah. That was the last record he ever made. Yeah, yeah, that's such a special thing, you know, isn't it? Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. You know, and as a drummer credit. as well, because obviously I haven't mentioned that you're a drummer hey. as well, so that, yeah. that that must be an amazing, just an amazing thing to master his record in the first place, like let alone, you know. Yeah, and he's, that... a, you know, he's a real hero of mine. The funny thing was is that he toured that record and he put me and Ro on the guest list for his O2 show. Yeah. And uh, he says, you come and see me after the show, Tim. We'll have a good old natter. And right. you smoke cigarettes, don't you? I went, yeah, I do. So he's going, great, we'll smoke indoors. He <laughs> 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 was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we, that we went to the cool. O2. He, he played the, started playing the show. It was wonderful. He still had that feel and that touch. Mm -hmm. But after half an hour, he, he, he got off the... 
drum kit and walk to the front of the stage and he gets the microphone and he goes, I can't do it anymore. I'm thinking half exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> And so that's it. And I'm not doing dr- my drum solo. It's just not on. Do you hear? And he's starting <laughs> freaking out. Everyone's going, all right, Ginger. Okay. <laughs> and that's it. And off he went. His manager came up to me and said, um, I said, right, can we go back and say hello to Ginger? He said he'd, you know, like to say hello and everything. And we went back and he was he was too knackered. <laughs> and you're still playing in the relationships? Oh, yeah, very much so, yeah. yeah. Also, you had a gig that was cancelled because of this, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I still get my email updates from Richard, so... Yeah, yeah, Richard's just joined Facebook, actually, so it may be the end oh, of I... days. <laughs> it must be. It yeah. must be. <laughs> Coronavirus, nothing. Richard Ravage on Facebook. Oh, my God. <laughs> There's a meltdown, yeah. The world is about to end, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, presuming the world doesn't end, have you got lots of future projects coming up? Obviously, yeah, you I said not own... much has changed for you, so... No, not really. No, I've just got I've got tons of work coming in all the time, and it's international as well. A lot of international bands. I have a lot of bands in America, okay. uh, and Australia, and all around Europe, and Japan, South Africa. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so I've got a lot of bands in because what happens is that um, people see your name or they've heard your name on the back of records that they've grown up with and yeah, loved. Yeah. They want the guy that did that record did to that, do their record. Course, makes sense. And through the joy of internet, you can just yeah, that's that all connected me. now. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. is so send me the really files. Open. And obviously, you have a, a a proper dynamo in the form of Ro. Anyway, she's like absolutely yeah. amazing. So like, I, well, I'm she has sure. to work cut out for because she's got to deal with all the admin of that. So there's all the. You know, the, booking them in, dealing with their requests, what kind of record... I like how you say she has to, <laughs> because you don't want to. <laughs> no. no. I'm sat in front of a terminal. I'm sat yes, in front of here, making it all that. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. You like keep, the income, though. Keep your, yeah, keep keep your head in the, in the spot it needs to be, I think, you know. Don't confuse... Yeah, yeah, the, like, you know, it's a lot, because, you know, I cut... 422 titles last year. That's Jeez. more than one a day. Lee. Yeah, that's crazy. That's a lot of work. Yeah. That's yeah. an insane work rate. Yeah, I've cut 18,000 records in my life. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Are you not thinking you might do 20 and then go, right, that's it, 20,000. I just might just spring say, it. Right, spring it on the person. Like, spring, yeah. and it's, you should spring it on the 20,000 and first person as they come in. Say, sorry, yeah. actually, I decided I'm quitting. <laughs> I'm not doing it anymore. I've actually worn my ears out. <laughs> they, look, they're not there anymore. There's yeah, just these they smooth... They're not working. Smooth, they're just decorative little shells. Just these now. Smooth panels where, like Marilyn Manson on the Mechanical Animals cover, it's all smoothed over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or the they ears on up. that ridiculous film, Waterworld. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, there yeah. you go. You take 10 years off your life. <laughs> Uh, so what is the obviously you've kind of said I guess but like what's the best bit and the worst bit of your job the worst bit probably being uh, trying to navigate the loudness war navigating the loudness war is kind of where it's at but I mean that's easy to do because you give it to them fat and loud and they love you and pay the bill the worst (laughs) aspect of the job yeah the the worst aspect of the job is dealing with um, certain major labels and bands managers who suddenly think they're engineers right you know and then you find out that you know they can't and then you say (laughs) you know what you know what the word manage means let's think of another word that means the same thing it means like cope isn't it can you cope because you can't can you (laughs) you know yeah Yeah. It's a, yeah, that's a really good, uh, uh, yeah, that's why I used to like A manager is a coper. Can you manage? Can you cope? And in a lot of cases, you can't cope. You know, You've got you a lot of these cope. little pearls. that I, yeah. I used to pick up one at least every, every session. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, and the best bit, I guess, is the working with amazing artists on amazing music. 
and getting your name on the record, you know, because with uh, with a lot of the Slade and Status Quo and Thin Lizzy, you know, you think Thin Lizzy, Jailbreak. What an right. amazing record. I had yes. that as a kid. I remember buying yes, it the, the day yeah. after it came out. And my name's on it now. You know, I did amazing. the reissue of amazing. that. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And so amazing. same with Status Quo, same with Slade, you know, but the Osmonds, that's quite funny, you know. I had a phone call from Jay Osmond when they were touring. It was about 10 years ago now I did their back catalogue. And Jay Osmond is the guy who does the high vocal in Crazy Horses. Yeah, yeah. Here they go, smoking up the sky. (laughs) World's first environmental song, I'll have you know. Ah, so uh, it is, yeah. Crazy Horses are cars here, and he goes, there they go, smoking up the sky again. You know, it's it's a kind of environmental thing. And uh, he just says, oh, thanks, man, we've never sounded so good. Awesome. Cheers. That'll do. Awesome. You can use that on the. (laughs) Thanks. I'll take that. I've got quite a few lovely (laughs) quotes. You know, when I did uh, Ginger Baker, uh, I said to Ginger, Can I have a quote for the website? And he said, Yeah, it's better than good. (laughs) That'll do. And then Graham (laughs) Parker, you know, Paul Samuel Smith. Paul Samuel (laughs) Smith from the Yardbirds as well. Great record. Yeah. Great work with him on a couple of film soundtracks. Right, yeah. Um, there was the yeah, Graham Parker got, stuff. Was what was that, that you were doing? Oh, uh, that was everything. His entire catalogue and a great big wow. box set. If you look at my website, I said to Graham, "Can we have a quote?" And he said, "He said, uh, exquisitely mastered by Tim Turan. I can't think of a better job being done, and I thoroughly recommend his work." And I thought, bloody hell. <laughs> Can't ask for much more than that, can you? Yes, well, you go and have a look on my website. There it is. Awesome. How long was that? How long was that job? That lasted about two months. Wow! And you're doing almost a record. You're just doing a life, and you're you're doing someone's whole life, effectively, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. You know everything Everything they pour sparks. Yeah, that's uh, in a way that's like a. I, I guess it's a heavy responsibility as well when you take on this thing where you're like, oh God, so yeah. I'm now representing this guy, what he's poured his whole life into for yeah. his whole life. It's the whole lot, and I'm in charge of making people. You get that with a lot of big catalogues, though, Lee, because what happens is um, I spoke to one of the record label bosses, and I said to him, I think it was when we were doing the Slade catalogue, and I said, you know, I've just mastered 20 eight, 29 records for Slade, their entire catalogue. And so how do you know if a campaign's gone well? And he goes, we look at Amazon reviews. Wow. Is that yeah. it? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Wow. That's how we know. You can't always tell from sales, but if you've got 600 people on Amazon giving it five stars, right. you know you've done a good job. And right. There's probably other sites as well they look at, but yeah, that was sure. kind of just... That's that's crazy, isn't it? I never would have yeah, thought. Yeah. Though I was just thinking then, and you very rarely read a review, even of a remaster edition in like a mojo or whatever, and actually hear much mm. about the mastering. It's yeah, even exactly. though that's one of the main things that's actually any different. From well, it is the main thing button. because the record's <laughs> been out before, it's the isn't same it? Thing. It's been reviewed <laughs> before. There might be a couple of extra liner notes, I guess, and things like yeah. that. And they usually get a mention. Yeah, they'll get they, someone but... like Charles Shaw Murray to write an essay or something, you know. And generally in the review, they'll say, oh, with some lovely revealing liner notes or extra photos from the sessions and everything. Yeah, but very rarely bonus get into... tracks that they add on the end. Yeah, but they very rarely get into whether it's actually mastered very well yeah, or not which is ridiculous whereas the the people who review on amazon that's the first thing they go because they've just had to repurchase their whole record collection again yeah so if you're a rabid slade fan you've already yes. bought all the records and then they probably got reissued on cd so you've got to buy them all again sure and then they've been remastered on cd yeah. so you've got to buy them all again yeah. so it better be worth buying it's the same with um what's sat on the shelf there all these lot here yeah. This is all the Madness back catalogue. Right, yeah. I forgot Madness. You did all of them, yeah. Yeah, did all the Madness stuff. And, you know, and so, you know, you're working on stuff like, you know, like My Girl's Mad at Me, Embarrassment, um, right, yeah. Night Boat to Cairo, right, One yeah. Step Beyond. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. Uh, it Must Be Love. Yeah. yeah. Our nice. House. 
Yeah, you know, these are yeah. major, major yeah, hits. Yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah. And you can't get them wrong. You've got to twiddle me yeah, buttons of course. and make them sound like God. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So they never need doing again, Lee. That's the whole idea. Yeah, it? yeah. It's done. You know. That's great. That's wicked. That's so. Like, yeah, I mean, um, the, yeah, what a, what a cool, um, what a cool thing though to have it it's your final say really isn't it yeah yeah which is nice yeah. it's like yeah and it was unattended i think uh i had one phone call with Suggs just to go over uh, some bonus tracks uh, right. but most of the time i was dealing with the label yeah which was salvo uh you do you find that level. generally you end up talking to one member of the band like yeah Otherwise, you know, um, but it's like when I was doing all the Dan stuff, it's really funny. I had Captain Sensible here for a day. Right. Uh, and then um, a couple of days later, I was, it was a double live album for the Dan's. And right. uh, I had to get the running order had got messed up on the liner notes as opposed to what I had on the audio. Right, sure. So I said, well, you know, the liner notes say this, but the audio is in a different order. So I said to the record label, let me talk to... Ray, because that's his actual name, mm-hmm. Ray Burns. Sure. Uh, Captain Sensible. So yeah. I rang up. I said, hello, Captain. Um, just need to... Get he said what? Hmm? Sorry, it's a joke. I said, you said, hello, Captain. He said, what? <laughs> so, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hello, Captain. Hello. I said what? So I said, can you send me through? <laughs> <laughs> can you send me through the running order, the actual running order that you want it in? Because I can't really swap the tracks around on a live record. Yes. Yeah. You've got to have it. Yeah, in the it's going to sound weird. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I waited a day, and then he sent me an email through, and it was just a picture of him feeding the ducks. <laughs> so this is the kind of... Kind of so you guessed. <laughs> you try to get sense out of people sometimes. Cause well, you yeah, I mean, uh, you might... Uh, yeah, he's, he's called Captain Sensible quite ironically as well. So, you know... <laughs> but yeah, he I mean, they very, were... He was very funny. Right, yeah. Yeah, Brilliant. awesome, Tim. Thank you so much, Rick, and thanks for giving up the time, and uh, long may you Thank be... Thank you for asking me, mate. No, I, I knew it'd be an entertaining uh, ride, so, Rick, awesome. You take care of yourself, and long may you uh, be uh, staring at the, the, the stars whilst also looking down and mastering them. Staring at your backdrop, mate. Lovely. <laughs> wicked. Take Brilliant, care of yourself, You dude. take care, mate. Thank I'll you. see you soon. interesting interview and I learned what mastering was. Awesome, from a master. From a master. So what's up next? We have got Sally who is going to be giving you a hair and makeup tutorial, particularly of how to do a 1940s style. 
Take it away, Sally. In this piece, I'm going to help you create a vintage look that you can do at home. I've gone for an early 40s World War II look and we're going to start with the hair. So first of all, you're going to have to do a wet set. The great thing about a wet set is that it's something you can do at the beginning of the week and hopefully if you've done it well enough, it should stay in for the whole week. Right, first things first, let's get our hair wet. Hi everyone and we're back with wet hair. First thing I'm going to do, just give it a quick brush through and then we're going to put on the setting lotion. The first thing you're going to do is set it on some curlers. You start by putting a parting in your hair. So I'm going to section off this hair. You are going to roll upwards and away from the face. You're going to roll your hair away from your face. At the top, you are going to go to the side. It's all going to go in the same direction. What you're going to do is you're going to roll it straight from straight up and you're going to roll it that way and clip it in place. So the sides are going up, the top is going over. Keep going like that. Okay, curlers in. What I like to do is a little natty thing. Get a nice scarf, instant turban. So we're gonna wait for our hair to dry and then we will look at styling it. The makeups that were available in the 40s, Max Factor, Pancake and Panstick, they were the favorites. I do actually have a Max Factor Panstick. I'm gonna start by brushing it on. It's very thick. With a perfectly modern concealer, tackle the problem areas makeup sponge I'm just gonna blend that in right I'm gonna set this with finishing powder and give you that lovely matte finish so I have my matte base next key element is eyebrows you're going to create quite a defined shape so just brushing them up was what I like to use on my particular brows I suppose it's like a pencil so I'm just following the natural line of my brow blusher just on the apples of your cheeks eyes so I'm gonna go for brown and I'm not gonna put on very much just under your brow here big thing was the eyeliner now you don't have to go around the whole eye so I'm keeping this here like this to dry because if you don't let it dry and you open your eyes it's going to give you a nice crescent shape up here this is my little uh, vintage uh, manicure but the key for the vintage look is the little half moon here so that's quite subtle lips next I'm going to go for classic red, but the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to use um, a lip primer. That's going to make a lovely base for my lipstick. So you can exaggerate the cupid's bow if you like, and I'm just going to fill in under the line. Check the teeth. Lips done. Mascara. So um, like with the lips, I like to prime my eyelashes first, and now I'm going to use um, just a regular mascara. The style in the 40s was to concentrate on the top lash. We'll come back and do the hair once it's dried. Right, I am creating my little victory roll. Quick hairspray. This is my silhouette, up at the sides and into the victory roll there. I am going to do one big victory roll here, back comb it and then create your roll and pin. Can you see my little whirl there? You can smooth it down with hairspray. Roll and roll. You can easily grab hold of a scarf or a hairband. Square, divided in half, like into a triangle. Just roll it over and do a bow or do a knot. Thank you for watching. Wow! I must try that look pretty soon. We're going to be uploading the full version of that on our YouTube channel, which also includes some history lessons about really? 1940s women and their style. Awesome. I like women in their 40s. What's next, Lee? Uh, next up, we're going to have some embroidery. How do you fancy making something? It's all a lot about making and doing this episode. So how do you fancy embroidering something? What's, uh, tell us more about that, Grace. Um, it is a t Japanese technique which makes the most out of holes in your clothes. So here's Bryn with more about that. Take it away, Bryn. Hello, um, I am Bryn Alcock. 
Today I am going to show you how to fix a shirt. Uh, it's a special technique that uh, makes use of the actual hole itself and makes a feature of it so that it's instead of disguising the hole you're making it look nicer. So today I'm going to fix up this shirt but the only problem with it was that there's a couple of holes, one in the front and three in the cuffs. So we shall be fixing that today. So here is a Sasha Co project that I actually have on the go at the moment. I've had it on the go for a while, but it basically just utilizes very thin embroidery irons using basic embroidery thread, just doing a little bit of decorative design over the whole piece. Here you can see that I have picked out some fabric to go with it, and then I'm gonna use this thread. Uh, to fix it with. Um, I'm going to iron on the piece of fabric using a piece of bonder web. Uh, this is just to add a little bit of stability whilst I sew it. So here you can see that I've decided to draw out just a couple of little sketch ideas of what I fancy uh, doing with my Sasha Co embroidery. Uh, I decided in the end I'm going to go for this one here uh, on the cuff where there's three holes and then make features as the sort of centers of the circles and then I thought I might go for this one as it sort of helps blend in with the pattern a little bit. So here you can see I have the cuff holes here. Uh, what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to cut away the loose bits of thread. So I'm just I'm not making the hole much bigger. I'm just cutting away the little bits of thread. So I'm now going to uh, uh, you can if you haven't got bond web you can just pin the fabric behind it or in front if you like. That's another thing you can just have a fabric patch. I'm just going to pin the fabric or bonder web in my case, just to the back here so that it shows through the hole. Uh, you want the right side facing outwards uh, and that way it, you get the nice bit of fabric rather than the back. Right, so here I have now um, added the fabric to the back of the piece. And so I'm going to use a ruler to measure out. This is the grid flower pattern that I'm doing on the front. I'm going to just mark out a rough square that I'm going to do. So just up to where the fabric on the back finishes. Right, I am now going to mark out uh, a each centimeter mark along the edges. Right, I've marked out all the points on the square. I am now going to just draw the lines to connect them to make a grid. Right, so I've drawn out the grid. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to place it in an embroidery hoop. Uh, so I'm just tying a little knot in the end. Pass my thread through and pull tight. For this first pattern, I'm going to go roughly in the center of the lines in between each square. And I'm just going to do a little stitch, just like that. And then I'm going to just go down the line just to save time and thread. So again, at the halfway point of in between each uh, coordinate vertex. So, um, so on this other line here, I am now going to go on every vertex uh, for the points. This will create an offset look. So just in between. So you're going to repeat this every other line in between the sort of points as you can see. Right, so I've just finished doing the rows going vertically. I am now going to start doing the rows going horizontally. Uh, I am 
just going to do the same thing, but every so often just missing a little bit of the stitch. So I'm going to so I'm gonna start in the middle here. Start off stitch there, and I'm hoping if I carry on going across, I'm going to get little four point stitches just like that one there. So you got one, two, three, four, like that. And uh, I'm going to do that all the way across, and then alternating between each row and half rows. Right, so I've finished doing the uh, embroidery for the cuff. Uh, I'm quite pleased with it. Uh, there's, and there's still a lot more I could be embroidering down, but I think that's mostly stuck down, and if it comes loose, I can always cut it off. The main point is that I've embroidered around these holes, and they're nice and secure, and they're not gonna come undone. Uh, and they just look rather nice, I think. Uh, they're, they're not too showy, but uh, they're, quite, they're quite nice. Nice bit of color brings out the shirt. Right, that's it. That's all the embroidery I'm doing today. Uh, I've nicely patched it up. I'm, quite, I'm really pleased with what I've managed to get done. Um, if you, I hope you like this video and uh, I hope that you uh, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your quarantine doing crafting. Amazing! That is, well, that was a lot of uh, hours like sped up really fast in that edit, wasn't it? Was. It was, it was about three. Crikey, wow, so yeah, so it doesn't just take those five minutes in case you're thinking that was really fast, but he's really quick with that. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for that, Bryn. Um, so that was quite a diverse array of stuff we had in this show. Um, hope you'll tune in next show. I think we're gonna have a little bit of a Prince theme going on. I've already started a little early with my purple paisley tie. Um, and yeah, it's going to be an entertaining show, again, filled with whatever you send us. Thank you so much to all of you who have sent in all your clips of your your skills, your small businesses. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And if you've got something to send in, please send it to aversionproduction at gmail.com so we can feature it on the next show. Or just get in touch and comment and stuff you like that. Always. Yeah, yeah. And if you like the show, please do share it with your friends if you have any. And so to finish off the show, it's Jeff Slate, who is a uh, world-renowned journalist and also a musician. He played an awesome gig in his living room for a local charity uh, near to him that provides meals for the medical uh, support teams in his uh, area. So with his song, Bailey Forgive Me, here is Jeff Slate. Thanks, Yay. everyone. Thanks Bye. for watching. Bye. Bye.